get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, RX Bar, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs. Nathan's been to one. We do them all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. We hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, where you're from, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, more. So if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate, to get your business to the next level, it's all about relationships. Um, and that's what Sourceify does too, right? Then go to rise25.com and find out where our next event is going to be. So Nathan, thanks for joining me. I'm going to introduce you in a second, but um, you were at our last event. What'd you think? Yeah, oh, amazing. I mean, the amount of people that I connected with was incredible. Cool. I did not pay you to say that. So, yeah. um, <laughs> um, so today we have Nathan Resnick. He's Sourcing Pro, founder of Sourceify. He's built multiple e-commerce companies, seven-figure Kickstarter projects and speaks fluent Mandarin on top of it. Sourceify is the fastest growing sourcing platform backed by Y Combinator that helps hundreds of companies manufacture products around the world. He even managed to get a cease and desist from Conor McGregor, yes, the UFC competitor. So we will talk a little about that too. Nathan, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, I'm excited. Yeah. So we won't reveal that yet, but um, I wanted to start with more of a nightmare story, uh, mistakes. Maybe you learned or you saw someone else learn because I'm sure there's a lot of there's a lot of fear around it. There's a lot of mistakes people make. What have you seen as a nightmare scenario? Obviously, that's why you know Sourceify fills a, a pain point. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the entrepreneurial journey is a matter of learning from your mistakes. You know, you got to go from one scenario to the other and continue to learn. Um, I can touch on one specific example I remember with one of my first e-commerce companies where, you know, whenever you're starting a new system, whether it be a fulfillment system or, you know, paid ad system, whatever it may be, you want to test it before you actually have to use it. And so I remember in one of our first fulfillment runs that we were doing, we ended up doing this fulfillment in-house. We had just finished a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter and we had, you know, 600 units that needed to be shipped the same day coming in from China, you know, typical crowdfunding fulfillment. And we had bought this like Dynamo, you know, label printer that was printing, you know, fine, but we never tested the actual printer before we needed to print the labels. And so it turns out we had bought the wrong labels, and this was over the weekend, and somehow the local, you know, Office Depot and Staples didn't have the right labels. So because we didn't have the right labels to print what was supposed to be shipped, you know, the packages were delayed like four days, and we felt super bad for our customers. And it was crazy too because that. Monday, I remember I was supposed to go back to China and we basically stayed up all night to, you know, four or five a.m. printing and packaging these labels. Um, for some of them, I think about three, four hundred of them, we hand wrote the labels and it was kind of this interesting dynamic where, you know, handwriting labels sucks. I don't recommend it, but it adds a personal touch. And so we literally created this whole video of like, we're handwriting our labels because we love our customers so much. And so there's kind of <laughs> good spin on that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's kind of that dynamic that you got to understand with a e-commerce company or any company in general where the more touch points you have, obviously the less scalable your business is going to be, but it can actually relate to a better customer interaction or experience. And so for those, you know, 3, 400 customers that we hand wrote labels for all in one night, a lot of them were extremely happy by the customer experience and you know a lot of times you wrote a little hand written note with it as well and so you know mistakes a lot of times you have to learn from and I've made you know a ton of other mistakes but that one really sticks out because I think it was early in my e-commerce you know entrepreneurship journey and it made me realize you know what like if you were struggling to get something done a lot of times you just have to understand the process to make it happen and optimize or just put in the work like for us you know, we spent six hours that night writing labels. So what's a big pain, what's the pain point Sourceify solves? Just so totally, people get an idea. 
I'll tell you, you know, my personal story starts in China. You know, in high school, I was a foreign exchange student over there. I was one of 48 American high school students to go over um, in 2010. Why did you decide to go over there as opposed to uh, nothing yeah. or as opposed to going somewhere else where you could I actually got, speak English? I got deported from America. No, I'm joking. Your parents, <laughs> your parents sent you away. Uh, um, you know, I always I have an older sister, and I always like to be different than her. And she started studying Spanish, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go study Chinese. And I started studying my freshman year of high school. Mm. My junior year of high school, you know, I I committed to going to China and living a full year there without ever having even been to Asia before. Wow. And really, it stemmed from my neighbor. He had done the program the year before me. Came back telling these incredible stories about living with a host family and being fully immersed, attending a local Chinese high school. I was like, wow, you know what? I, I have an older sister. I know what I'm going to do here in America during my junior year of high school. Why not try something different? And so I went over there. I was 16 years old. And it turns out my host dad at the time was a manager of, of a big trading company. And so he would start talking about these factories. And I was like, wow, like all these factories can produce all these products. That's incredible. And so I started selling products on eBay and Amazon in high school. And then I was like, you know what? I always wanted to create my own product. And so in college, I ended up inventing the first leather watch strap without holes, worked like a zip tie, like a belt buckle. Mm. That grew to a six-figure Shopify store. And as that grew, people and companies began to ask me, you know, Nathan, how do you produce products effectively overseas? I looked at the current options out there. You know, you have Alibaba, Global Sources, a whole bunch of trading companies and agents, but there was no one that I really felt confident in recommending. You know, if I recommended Alibaba, there's a very high chance that my friends fall victim to fraud or that they work with a trading company, don't have a great experience. And so I realized there was this huge untapped opportunity to create a software platform that would streamline your manufacturing process. I mean, for us at Sourceify, we aren't like an open marketplace where you go on and search for products. You actually submit a product that you want to manufacture. So you come to us knowing the product, knowing your specs, knowing how many units you want to produce, and we get you through a production run faster and more cost effectively than ever before through our software. And so it kind of stemmed from, you know, number one, facing the problem myself where overseas manufacturing is extremely difficult. I mean, the amount of time that you have to spend managing a factory and making sure you're hitting your production timeline is crazy. And it's also crazy that it's all managed through email and Excel. You know, obviously you got WeChat and WhatsApp and Skype, but you know, I, I've been in some production runs where I'm communicating across three platforms. I can't remember what I said where, and I'm having to search back and see totally. what the heck's going on with all those details. Yeah. So, you know, it stemmed from my own pain points, and I think that's a lot of times where the best companies start. You know, experiencing that pain yourself and creating a solution to to grow. You know. I want to talk about the process of when someone lands on Sourcefy and kind of taking us through a case study. But before we do, we are talking right before we hit record on transparency. And you mentioned something about how many quotes should someone get before they know they have the right price. It's almost like that old Tootsie Roll commercial. How many yes. bites does it take to get to the middle of it? <laughs> how many quotes does someone get before they know they have hit on the pricing they should be at? Yeah, you know, something that my team and I have been talking a lot about is transparency in supply chain and you know most companies supply chains are like this black magic box you don't know how much they're buying the unit for you don't know how much they're shipping it for you don't know any numbers behind a company's supply chain like that's their trade secrets and so these companies like 3pls or shipping companies use that you know trade secret it can charge companies different prices for different products or services and so you know our goal at sourceify is adding transparency and visibility into a supply chain where we typically go out and get you three to five factory quotes on the products that you're looking to manufacture through our platform but then we talked we started talking about 3pls freight forwarding you know there's so much opportunity to add transparency and visibility to a supply chain i'll give you a quick example where you know we have a user right now who's trying to air freight products over from his warehouse in Shenzhen and doing a direct injection into you know UPS or FedEx or USPS so he doesn't have to you know re warehouse and work with a 3PL here in America and we're talking to all these you know multi billion dollar freight forwarding companies like DHL UPS and a, a bunch of different mom and pop you know shipping agents and we're getting quotes across the board i mean literally we're giving these people the same specs same volume and we're getting quotes that vary you know to be honest 
over five dollars. You know, some people are quoting us, you know, four thirty. Some are quoting us over ten dollars. Hmm. What is the wow. reason for this price variance? You know, it's the same method, same product that we're looking to ship, and there's so much. How price do you explain variance that? There. Why is why is it vary so much? I think number one, it's relationships. Number two. It's that people honestly want to make you know dollars. They want to have the biggest margin that they can. And if you aren't transparent in your supply chain, if these aren't, if these service providers aren't transparent in their supply chain, you know they can charge you whatever they want as their service fee. And so even you know I'm not gonna rat on any companies here, but I know some you know 3PL fulfillment companies that act like they have their own facility. And they don't, you know, they just provide these software and order management systems. So they have to mark it up to pay for their stuff too. Exactly, yeah. 100%. And so, you know, if you're working with a service provider that provides amazing service, that's great. But, you know, if you're really looking to save some, some costs and go directly to the source, then, you know, you might want to try that and see how the price differs. And so it's kind of crazy in the supply chain world right now where, like why should our users like why should we have to go out and talk to 10 different people get 10 different quotes from 3pls and have different prices you know um and that kind of stems and that's from, on that's just on the shipping side right we're not even right, talking the just, product you know. yeah exactly yeah. that's just on the shipping side and like you know it's crazy because there's as far as to my knowledge there's no marketplace that has all these 3pls bidding on products to do fulfillment for i think that's a massive mm. opportunity right there um, and that's similar, you know, to what we're doing with product sourcing and manufacturing. But at the same time, it, you know, setting up that system is obviously easier than said than done. But there's no reason that someone should have to go out, talk to 10 3PLs, get 10 different quotes. What's, what's the variance here? You know, what's really causing the prices to be different, like you're saying? And what, like, is it fueled through relationships? Is it fueled through the service? Is it because they don't own their own assets? You know, there's so much variance here. Um, and even, like, for example, Quick example, one of our partners, Flexport. You know, Flexport is the fastest growing freight forwarding company in the world. They do an incredible job, amazing company. But when they started, you know, when Flexport started, they were basically a freight broker that was fueled through software. Now they're starting to lease their own planes, you know, book their own cargo space. But before, they started as a, you know, just a freight broker, an agent basically that had software. And now they've taken a step forward and really tried to control more of the assets control more of the shipping lanes, and that enables them to give better service, give better pricing, give better transparency, because before, you know, they're asking different, uh, you know, providers to say, hey, what's the rate to, uh, you know, put a container on a cargo ship from Shenzhen to Long Beach or, you know, wherever it may be. And so it's an interesting dynamic, I think, as maybe a service provider grows, they begin to control more assets, but I think there's, you know, in supply chain in general, there's little transparency. Um, I think that can be applied to a lot of different segments of the e-commerce world. But, you know, our focus is the supply chain. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line, you know, Nathan, with this is there's a lot of moving parts here. And so if someone tries to navigate them themselves, there's a lot of room for error, I guess you could say. And I feel like, you know, doing the research with Sourceify, you know, people could go from an idea to a finished product. Um, using Sourceify, so I want to kind of talk about some of the different use cases, right? Because everyone there's different, so I want to find out your favorite case study, and then I'll Definitely. tell you about the one I like uh, that yeah. I read about Sourceify. What's what's your favorite one where someone came to you? What was the issue, and then what happened? Um, you know, I give a quick example. One of the watches that I own is a company called Thomas Felice. They're an e-commerce company run through Squarespace, I think. And they came to us, they had been trying to manufacture their watches through Alibaba and were struggling. You know, I had a horrible experience, couldn't figure out who was who, couldn't get through a production run. Literally, we connected them with three factories, got them three price quotes on their watches within a few days. They ended up getting samples within, you know, two and a half weeks or so, ended up in That's production quick. off those one samples. And now they're, you know, a fast growing watch brand. And so it's, you know, really what excites me with Sourceify is the product development side. Like two weeks ago, we handled our first uh, cosmetics blend where we had a cosmetics mm. company looking to create their own cosmetics. And for us, it's all demand driven. You know, the more companies that we have looking to produce certain products, we dive deeper into that uh, product category. So, for example, if you look at the top 100 Shopify stores, 
most of the products that they're selling are segmented within 10 product categories. Hmm. So we focused our supply base to start on those 10 product categories. We now work with over 700 factories around the world that we've pre-vetted. Uh, all of them meet you know, industry certificates, like if they're sunglasses, you know, they obviously have to be FDA approved. There's certain industry certificates that we have with our factories. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a matter of streamlining production and getting someone to produce their products faster than ever before. Um, and I would say really, here's the thing. Here's what a lot of people don't understand from the factory side of the table. If you're a factory right now, how do you get new business? You know, you're either going to open marketplaces like Alibaba or Global Sources, or you go to the trade shows like the Canton Fair. Both sources provide a lot of lead flow, but the problem is the quality of that lead flow is crap. If you get 100 leads through Alibaba, less than 2% end up in a production run. So these factory bosses are so fed up because they yeah. have 10, 20, They're spinning their reps. wheels, yeah. Exactly. You know, 30 sales reps trying to qualify those leads. And so for you, you got to ask yourself, if you're a new buyer, how do you stand out? If, how do you get the best price? And so, you know, a source of it, because we add this transparency into the supply chain and we only send out uh, products that people want to produce to our factories, the factories know the leads through source of I have a much higher likelihood of ending up in production. And so it's a different dynamic in the, you know, product sourcing manufacturing world. And I think there's, you know, we're only a year in. The source of I is only just over a year old and we're growing by 300% year over year. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun and we're always excited to help companies bring products to life. What have you found are some of the most popular product categories? Because what you're finding too is it's probably driven by buyers right i mean that's totally. why so you know to kind of reverse the process people should start thinking about you know if they're thinking about what they should create in a certain category you know i'm curious of what are the most popular product categories and what do you recommend people stay away from on, on the flip side so i would say all just this from a bird's eye view and then dive in if yeah. you're looking to create your product or even if you're a you know fast growing amazon seller and looking to extend your product category there's three main questions you should ask yourself. Number one, interest. Would you buy this product yourself? I feel like a lot of times if you're an entrepreneur selling a product that you wouldn't buy yourself, it's a less likelihood that you'll have success. Number two is the actual margins. You know, you're producing a product for X amount of dollars and selling it for X amount of dollars. That gives you your gross margin. Is your gross margin enough to cover the operational costs, cover yeah. the marketing expen expenses? Run your numbers. You know, there's no point in diving into a new product if the mar if the numbers don't even make sense. Totally. And then number three, complexity. You know, if you have to go out and spend thirty thousand dollars on opening a new mold for a new product, that's thirty thousand dollars. That's uh, you know, cost for you to produce that new product before you even sell one of those products. Now imagine you produce the less complex product and said, mm -hmm. look, I'm going to spend that thirty thousand dollars on inventory. You're already starting off on a better foot. You might not have as yeah. much you know, protection or difference around that right. product. But if you're just starting up, you know, if you're doing under, I would say, half a million in sales or so, like putting thirty thousand dollars or more, whatever how much a mold costs for your product is an investment, and that's how you have to look at it. You have to run the numbers. How long is it going to take you to recoup that mold cost? Yeah, and run the numbers behind it. And so I think those are really the three main traits that we look at when kind of diving in to see what products someone should produce. So what about product categories? What's what's most popular now? Totally. So product categories, I mean, it kind of stems from the top 100 Shopify stores. You know, apparel, especially athletic apparel is huge right now. Watches, hats, bags, sunglasses, socks. Socks are really big. Hmm. Um, shoes, shoes are a bit harder to develop. And then a lot of cosmetics, you know, hair extensions, um, fake nails, like all that stuff, even though it's cheap products, like you get some influencers that are on board. I mean, yeah. um, you know, we, we work in, in some sense with Brand Value Accelerator, a big uh, Shopify yeah. agency here in San Diego. Uh, you know, Dylan Whitman, great guy who yeah. founded that agency. Um, you know, they've handled hundreds of millions of dollars in Shopify sales. Yeah. And a lot of times it just stems from big stores like Movement Watches or Kylie Cosmetics, you know, their marketing like you look at movement watches as an example, that in my mind is not a watch company. That is a marketing company that sells watches. Hmm. And the difference is the quality of their watches is not nearly as high as other watch companies like Original Grain or Vincero watches. 
it's just their branding and marketing is incredible. I mean, you know, hats off to, to Jake and Kramer for growing that company. They're incredible people. But at the end of the day, too, like, you know, their watches from a manufacturing standpoint, our estimates, they produce them for about $10.17 or so. They have over, you know, a 90% gross margin on their, you know, main line of watches, which is great, but they also spend a ton on marketing and brand development. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's, um, there's different category, you know, different, I guess, places in the market for the products. I was talking to a Young Nails, uh, the, the company Young Nails. I think they're, they're out near you, but, you know, talking about the cosmetic and nail and hair extension. Um, and that reminds me, you talk about redundancy a bit and not just having one manufacturer for a product. Can you talk about the importance of that? Because I feel like some people think, oh, I got it. I got the manufacturer. I'm good. And then you're, you're saying something a little different. Here's the thing, you know, and take notes on this line. You never want to be single sourced. And by single sourced, I mean you don't want to only work with one manufacturer. If something happens to that factory, you know, God forbid – the factory burns down or there's you know a problem with their process you're gonna be out of inventory for at least three months or more and it's crazy like this isn't even a problem for smaller e-commerce companies this is also a problem for big retailers like you look at uh, all birds the fastest growing shoe company in the world right now they've raised you know almost 30 million dollars in VC funding incredible shoes we're talking all birds they're single sourcing their shoes out of I think it's Korea and it's crazy because what if something happens in that factory? Like they'll be out of inventory and you know out of business for like three or four months. Like yeah. it's insane. And so, from any level in the e-commerce world yeah. or retail world, world, you never want to be single source. Yeah. So I think it's good to obviously have your main source and someone you can rely yeah. on, but you always need a backup plan and yeah. sometimes even you know two backup plans. How do you convey that? Because it's it's only when something happens is when they're like, I gotta get another source. Like. You know, it's like, oh, I don't need a, an alarm until I get burglarized. Like, it, it, prevention is much harder to sell. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, how do you convey that to someone? Because right now, probably anyone who's single sourced, I would imagine, should be going out using Source of I or some other means to find an equivalent. They're in a good position, a strong position to do yeah. it before something happens, but it's prevention is hard to sell, I feel. Right. So, I mean, everyone that uses Sourceify, they're, they're never single source because we typically provide them with, you know, two, three or up to five different factory partners they can work with. But at the end of the day, if you're single source, think about what's going to happen to your inventory, especially, you know, with, you know, a lot of people are starting to plan for Q4 already with the holidays coming up. Something happens at your factory, you don't have inventory for Q4. That's the biggest headache in, 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 in the world where you have customers that want to buy your product and you don't have product to sell. You know, what are you gonna do, put out a wait list? Like, there's so many issues with inventory planning and management, and so I think a lot of times, too, people overlook the data in their supply chain. Like, you can literally analyze the data from your past quarters to see how many products you should be selling, what's your, you know, month over month growth or year over year growth, and analyze how much more inventory you think you have to buy for, you know, Q3 or Q4 or Q1 next year and analyze that now so you're prepared ahead of time. You know, you want to beat your numbers from last year, but if you don't have the product or inventory to do that, then, you know, you aren't setting yourself up for success. Yeah, I mean, I also, you know, Nathan, want to hear about if there's any products or types of products you say no to, um, but I want to talk a little bit because, you know, the, the watch company – is a use case, right? Someone's trying to source that they can't new, but you also had a case um, with Loom, uh, I think it was Loom Cube, they were growing really fast and they wanted to start another line. Yeah, I mean, so that's another thing that, you know, companies need to look at to grow is extending their product categories. You know, if you have one main product category, that's great. Like, let's say, uh, I'll give you a case, original grain watches, they make incredible stainless steel and wooden watches. Now they have an amazing customer base that loves their watches. They're extending product lines to, you know, wooden bracelets or wooden sunglasses. Like extending your product line when you already have a good customer base is incredible because then you can remarket different products to the same people. And those people are already f familiar with your brand. You know, they might be your best fans and they're going to buy whatever you put out there. Like you look at, you know, probably one of the biggest uh, most brand loyal driven brands in the world, Supreme. 
You know, Supreme puts their label on anything and people go crazy about it because the brand loyalty is so high. I mean, honestly, I don't think it would matter what they're producing. I think people would still buy their products just because their brand equity and loyalty is so high. And so I think from a e-commerce standpoint, you know, there's a difference in investing in a brand and really kind of, you know, doing a churn and burn type of business model where you're trying to find, you know, product market fit or an ad set that will scale up and run it till, you know, you have too many competitors or till the ad set dries out. Um, it's, that's different than creating a brand and, you know, pretty much every, you know, 40, 50, 60 plus million dollar company that I know has created their own brand and invested in their own brand. I'm not saying you can't grow without building your own brand, but what I'm saying is that you're going to be, you know, running different products all the time and you might have to sell more than, you know, a few different products to get to that number if you're kind of taking that uh, approach that's less brand driven. What happened with LoomCube? Well, LoomCube was, I mean, they're an amazing e-commerce company here in San Diego and they've done multiple Kickstarter campaigns. They've done, uh, you know, a ton of different events with a bunch of Red Bull athletes like Jamie O'Brien and Ryan Sheckler. And they were looking to, you know, create more GoPro accessories. There are these amazing lights that go on a GoPro to, you know, light up the night, basically. If you want to film at night or take photos at night, they have these amazing accessories and they wanted to extend their product line. So they came to us, you know, they don't have boots on the ground like we do and they aren't, you know, knowledgeable in every single product category. So they came to us and said, hey, we want to extend our product line. Can we move forward with this? And that's what we did. So they already had the audience there. It was a pretty easy transition. And, you know, really they knew the products that they wanted to manufacture, which was the beauty of it. I mean, if you come to us and ask us to recommend products to manufacture, we'll help you figure out which products you should move forward with. But if you come to us and say, hey, you know, I have an idea that I want to sell, you know, this product to this market, it's got to be a little more honed down than that. And so I think really at the end of the day, it kind of comes back to the data. You know, LoomCube knows what products their customers like. And when you know what products your customers like, you have a much higher chance of success when you extend your product line. What projects do you have to say no to? What the, what, I don't know if there's a specific category or product or what have you had to be, whether it's, you know what, we just, that's not our specialty or you know what, that's against the law. No, I mean, yeah. no, no. <laughs> right, right off the bat, um, electronics and IOT devices. I mean, you have a lot of hardware startups that want to start producing, you know, all sorts of IOT devices or electronic devices. And the lead times just to start production are like six to eight months. It's crazy. They're sorting out all the tech, the electronics. I mean, the process to start the manufacturing of a hardware product is a lot longer than a soft good product and like even yesterday I was talking to uh, Jen who leads innovation at Foxconn you know based in San Francisco they've done some strategic investments in hardware startups and really the dynamic there is for Foxconn is they they see where the retail and you know e-commerce world is heading they see where the hardware world is heading and it, it ties in you know in goes hand in hand with what's going on in the world because for them you know they're typically manufacturing for Apple and Dell and billion plus dollar companies but they also want to be more innovative and see how they can, you know, make their, their lead times faster, see how they can produce in smaller quantities. And so they've been investing in some hardware startups. But, you know, for, for her, she said it's always crazy to see the kind of over projections and timelines that some of these hardware products have to get through a production process because, mm-hmm. you know, their timelines are, are always off and the projections are, you know, not always accurate either. So it's something you have to understand, I think. Um, and really have a strong grasp of the market you're going into. Like, you know, one of my friends is the founder of Pebble Watches, Eric, and, you know, their story of Pebble Watches is incredible where they became the most funded project on Kickstarter. You know, now I think they're the second or third most funded, you know, raised, I think, 10 or $15 million on Kickstarter. That's amazing, yeah. Incredible, incredible product, but they, you know, to be honest, Eric was saying they kind of lost product market fit when the Apple smartwatches came out, you know. The trend towards Apple watches and Apple products really took a toll on their business and they kind of lost a lot of customer loyalty because they couldn't find, you know, really what's the main reason why people were buying Pebble watches. And so, you know, I think in the hardware market, which also translates to any, you know, product market fit is you have to ask yourself, 
Why are people buying my product? Mm. So anything else besides like the electronics and hardware that you say, no, this is not our wheelhouse? Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't do any like food or industrial products or, you know, it, we do a lot of different products, but pr like car parts we wouldn't do. I mean, there's some stuff that comes out yeah. that we just know to. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's for us, we're always trying to help people, you know, help uh, people get through a manufacturing process as fast as possible. But, at, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's not worth, you know, your time or our time to work together. So how do you deal with copycats, right? So some people want to be innovative. They want to start their own brand. And some people just want to are worried about, you know, they just want to make a dollar, right? And they don't care about that because, you know, they could be like, oh, you know, hey, Nathan, I just want the same thing as Thomas Felice, but I'm going to call it Nathan yeah. Resnick. And you, yeah. obviously they know you connected them with the sources that created it. So how do you yeah. deal with the, that influx of, I mean, it's almost a, a little bit of an issue. Like you want people referring a ton of people to Sourceify, but some people may not want to divulge that they use Sourceify because then people will maybe try and knock them off. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. I would say that, from a e-commerce standpoint, it stems from the brand. So your protection stems from your trademark. Um, if it's a new product, you can get like a provisional patent on it or something, but really it stems from the brand that you're creating, like that's your IP right there. Um, and then if you're talking about overseas, you know, IP protection, it's not gonna be worth your time to file, you know, a trademark or patent in China or, or anywhere in Asia. Um, but it is, you know, worth your time to protect your products at the border. You know, that's really where I think a lot of the brand protection comes in is making sure you have a trademark um, or a patent for your products here in America. You know, one of the biggest uh, you know, patent cases that we've seen on Amazon is with the TRX straps where, you know, these TRX workout straps, they're doing tens of millions of dollars in sales and they were getting knocked off like crazy by third party Amazon sellers and they were basically the same product they were selling. And so TRX had patents on the design and I think some of the utility and filed a suit against the biggest third party seller here in America. You know, it took them a lot of uh, legal fees and it was a long, you know, I think almost two year long legal battle, but they won. And really I think what that means for Amazon is that if you've created or designed your own product or have your own brand where it's obvious someone is knocking it off, yeah. courts here in America, you know, the legal system here in America is going to protect you. It's going to take some time and money. But I mean, I'm pretty sure they won like 20 or $30 million from that suit just because lost sales through these competitors and from the you know revenues that these competitors were making, knocking them off. So it's something to be, keep in mind. Um, but really, I think at the end of the day, IP protection stems from the brand. It stems yeah. from what you've created. It stems from your audience and, and you know your marketing. So you're saying basically, if they're okay, Nathan, I got these group of uh, manufacturers. It's really their job to make it unique, to solve a specific problem, and then to protect it afterwards. Not, I mean, if you know, if that brand didn't, you know, take those steps and someone else knocks it off, it's sort of less protection. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, at the end of the day, especially through Sourcefire, we put a lot of pressure on our factories to make sure that they aren't, you know, selling your products elsewhere or using your products for other customers. Um, and it depends. Like, if it's a mold that you don't even create that you're just using someone else's mold for, like, if it's a, you know, Yeti cooler, for example, we did some coolers, and it's like this you know, uh, buyer, this company is putting their own logos and branding on these coolers. Like it's not their mold and the factory was open enough to enable them to use this mold and use this design. Um, and so it's very hard for them to go out and say, oh, like now we own this cooler mold. Well, you know, short answer is you don't own the mold. The right. long answer though is that you own the brand within that, within that cooler. So if you're importing a cooler, say, you know, Jeremy's coolers, whatever it may be, you now own that Jeremy Cooler brand, but you don't own the actual, you know, physical product design. You own that, right. you know, no one else can call their coolers Jeremy. Yeah, totally. What's been your experience with Y Combinator? Incredible. Talk about I that. Mean, yeah, when did so, you start that and, and what did you, yeah, so, what have you gotten out of it? With Y Combinator, you know, number one, for people that don't know what Y Combinator is, it's, you know, really, I think the most famous and most successful investment group in the world. They were the uh, investment group that backed, you know, Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe, um, a lot of billion plus dollar startups, which is incredible. And, you know, they have this program that is every winter and every summer, 
that enables companies to really access that network to grow fast. Um, and so for us, uh, you know, we applied. We had, you know, I had two friends that went through the program before. They both highly re- recommended it. You know, we applied and um, actually got an email while I was in China. Said, "Hey, we want you come and come up to San Francisco for an interview on Friday." And I was like, "Well, I'm in China. I mean, do you want me to, you know, fly over for the interview? Is there any other time we can do it?" And I was going back that Sunday, so I ended up uh, taking a red eye from Guangzhou to LAX, and then spending a night in LA and flying to SF to be there Monday. Um, go on the interview, it's crazy, you know, super fast. It was, I think, 10, 15 minute long interview. They just dive so deep, you know, understanding everything about your market yeah. and who you are right off the bat. Um, and they really put in top partners in the interview. You know, we were uh, interviewed, and our interview was uh, Sam Altman, you know, the president of Y Combinator, uh, incredible, very knowledgeable guy. And it really makes it so they care a lot about who's in the program and who's in the incubator because a lot of times you talk to some other programs or you talk through, um, you know, different VC groups and you're talking to an associate or you're talking to an assistant or whatever it may be. And you sometimes have to go through, you know, one or two loopholes before you, you know, talk to the top dog for them. Their process is look, submit an application. If we want to interview, we'll interview you. You get to interview with, you know, the partners and leaders of Y Combinator and then they literally call you within a few hours if you got in. So we got a call within you know three or four hours. They invited us to the program. It started uh, this past January, so about four months ago. And it's a three, three and a half month long program. And you dive deep. You know, you really try to move as fast as you can. They provide a little funding. I mean, Y Combinator has standard deals terms where they give $120,000 for 7% of your company. And that is, to be honest, the most expensive money a startup is gonna take. But at the end of the day, the network and access to uh, mentors and advisors is yeah. incredible. You know, we've talked with so many founders who have started hundred plus million dollar companies through Y Combinator, and everyone's been through the same struggles before. And so for us, it's not like we're asking anything new per, per se. It's that we're getting access to the right people to answer our questions. And yeah. so um, it's been that's amazing. invaluable. Yeah, exactly. I think at the end of the day, it's like anything. You know, what you put in is what you're going to get out of it. You definitely have some companies or some people that go through different programs and expect it to be some, you know, golden or magic ticket. It's not, you know, you still have to put in the work. You still got to, totally. um, you know, put in the time and, you know, we still have a, a really long way to grow up. I mean, look at like Dropbox. The, yeah. Things. What's some of the feedback you've gotten? From the- um, you know, really for us, we're focusing on our software. So you probably see on our website right now, we have a upfront paywall. And the reason, the only reason we have that upfront paywall is because we aren't handling payments between a company and a factory right now. And we'll start handling payments between a company and a factory next quarter. That paywall will be decreased significantly or we'll take that out completely and we'll make more money money processing these payments. Mm. You mean instead of charging, that's what I was going to ask why you decided on the pricing model, but you're exactly. saying you will make maybe a per unit per, uh, amount, like if someone orders a thousand units, because and you'll basically help be that middle transaction? Right, exactly. And so um, that kind of will tie into factories paying us for the lead flow, and then financing these production runs is huge. You know, we talked to Wells Fargo two weeks ago. Wells Fargo partnered with Flexport and invested in Flexport to start Flexport Capital. Um, you know, we might take the same route with them in terms of starting Sourceify Capital to help e-commerce companies and retailers fund production runs because it's crazy. You know, a lot of times you're having to pay 100% for your inventory up front before you even sell one unit, and that's really uh, a hard balance on your cash flows. So, you know, for us, we you know charge us upfront fee right now, still provide the same incredible service. Um, and at the end of the day, it's basically going to be the same amount of money that we're making. It's just through a different format. Yeah, it's it's more digestible for the end user. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So what else? That's that's great. What other feedback have you gotten from the people at Y Combinator or going through this process? I mean, it's got to be you know for us software driven. You know, YC primarily invests in you know software companies or, or companies that are disrupting a certain space. You know, they see us disrupting a company's supply chain and, and especially on the manufacturing product sourcing side. And you know, we could scale up through an operations team, but at the end of the day, we want to scale up through software. You know, being operationally driven like a Lian Fung or William E. Connor, they're basically consulting groups for manufacturing. They're basically like a Boston consultant group of manufacturing and you know, you're paying them, you're exchanging your money for their time. For us, 
we want to use software where you're you know being able to exchange uh, you know, money for, for a great experience through field through software. How do you decide on the pricing initially? Uh, it's all based on customer feedback. I mean, we've tested a few different price points, um, and it also you know depends on our costs as well. You know, we've got to eat here as well. Totally. And then, how do you? What does the team look like? How do you manage sorts of? Yeah. So right now, I mean, we're a lean team. We have six here in San Diego and uh, three over in Guangzhou. Uh, we'll be tripling in size this year and uh, probably tripling again next year. So it's been fun. I mean, you know, it's kind of this dynamic where uh, a lot of these software companies, you know, a lot of times because you're able to scale up through your software, you don't necessarily need to have hundreds of people. You can become a $100 million company with, you know, 10 people. I think that'd be incredible. Where do you find a lot of the customers are coming from? I see a big use case for like Kickstarter. Because they're yep. probably they, they get all these funders and then they're like, okay, we got to produce this thing. But wh- yeah. where are, where are people coming from? So most of our users are through you know the millions of stores on on Shopify, Amazon, you know, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and then retailers. You know, um, there's a huge trend in retail where, for example, last month I spoke at ASD Market Week, one of the biggest retail trade shows in the world with forty thousand retailers and wholesalers, and traditionally. Retailers are going to buy through wholesalers, but now there's this huge trend where retailers are going direct to factories because they need to increase their margin. You know, they can't pay a wholesaler 30 to 50 percent. They've got to go directly to a factory to increase their margin. So that's really been the trend there in retail, and that's been fueling a lot of our growth. So, Nathan, I always ask since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? And then you probably don't have any low moments in business, right? But um, and then what's been on the flip side been one of the proudest moments or milestones? So you know the low moment, it's crazy. I mean, this was just last year in June. I had my my co-founder at the time who was in Europe. You know, we were planning to uh, move into this office together and start you know working on Sourceify. And he was traveling Europe with his girlfriend and called me and said, you know, Nathan, like I've had a family emergency, something's gone wrong. I, he basically said, I'm not going to be able to start Sourceify with you and I'm going to have wow. to drop out. And he was our, you know, lead developer was going to develop our wow. platform. And so literally this day that we had, uh, we were supposed to move in our office my you know, then lead developer called me and said, look, Nathan, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to start Sourcefy with you. And I was in shock, you know. This was at 6 a.m. and you know, already had been uh, accepted in this you know, co-working incubator office type of space and uh, was gonna get ready to go. And then at 7 a.m., got a call from my dad and my dad says, Nathan, your grandma has passed away. I'm like, you know, wow. That's Two- a bad day. Yeah, two incredibly important people passing or you know leaving me in one day is nuts. I mean, you know, my grandma uh, passed peacefully, and you know, sure she's in a better place now. But you know, I realized I, I was sitting there. You know, uh, I, I was crying to be honest. You know, I was, I was very just yeah, kind of hit, hit a wall, and I said to myself, "Look, number one, what do I think my grandma would want me to do, and number two, can I still go out and build this company? You know, do I need to have this co-founder? And I think a lot of times in the startup world, people think they need a co-founder, think they need someone to build a company with them. At the end of the day, you know, you need a great team and you need people to support you as you grow. But if you start yourself and start growing, there's no reason you need to give, you know, 30 or 50 percent of your company to anyone else. You know, you can do that yourself and grow a team around you as you grow or as you, you know, become profitable or as you raise money. You don't have to necessarily start with with other people. And so, you know, for me, uh, I said, look, you know what, uh, I'm going to go about this journey and, and see how far I can get and make it happen. And so uh, ended up, you know, moving into our office space alone. It was just me. And uh, to see, you know, how far we've come in the past year has been incredible. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I, I can't thank everyone that has supported us and, and you know, heard of Sourceify before and is, is getting interested in it because, you know, it's a roller coaster. It, you know, for us, too, it's like, look, we're starting a company here. We're trying to disrupt an industry. We're taking on some big fish. And, you know, the process that we're creating, you know, we, we love hearing customer feedback. We love helping people. But at the end of the day, you know, 
in I think a lot of times in, in entrepreneurship, there's sometimes this mirage of success. It's like, look, you know, every company goes through that roller coaster. And even like, for example, uh, one of our investors, the founder of GoFundMe, GoFundMe is this incredible platform that people use around the world to raise money for uh, all sorts of charitable yeah, causes. It could be like a medical condition that they have or, you know. Exactly. And so GoFundMe is this incredible business where, you know, they started, I think, about 10 or 12 years ago, but the founders, you know, had an incredible success where they sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. But what a lot of people don't realize is that that didn't happen overnight. You know, it happened over the course of eight or nine years. Like same with Dropbox. You know, Dropbox started uh, 11 or 12 years ago and they just went public. And so, you know, seeing the journey and really having a team that's there for the long run is extremely important. And I think that's one of the most overlooked parts of starting a company. You know, if you are hiring someone new, ask them, you know, what's going to keep you here in five years? You know, what's going to keep you here in 10 years? Think longer term, because I think when you have that longer term vision and when you have that, you know, thought in your head of where you want to create a company that outlives you or like, you know, listen to uh, uh, how I built this, Michael Dell, you know, the founder of Dell Computers, listening to him talk and understand how he went through the process. I mean, he was making over $60 million when he was 21. Incredible. And that company now is, you know, at that time it sounds like a lot, but now it's making you know, tens of billions of dollars. It's, it's crazy. And, you know, to see how he's put himself and put Dell in a position to outlive himself, I think is something that every entrepreneur should think about. Um, and, you know, there's obviously certain, you know, startups that go for more of a, you know, quick growth and flip type of model, which, you know, you don't always understand and know the, circumstances in the future but i think having it in your head in terms of how is this gonna you know turn out over the next 10 years because you know at the end of the day i don't think 10 years it's it's not that long of a time period i mean most people live to be around 80 or so nowadays i mean one eighth of your life i mean some people say maybe the younger ones are better than the older ones but uh we, we can talk again in 30 years and see how we do <laughs> we'll do this in 10 years i'm gonna mark my yeah. calendar 10 years from now um, no, and I, think, I appreciate you sharing that because it's, it is oftentimes we just hear of a success and we think it's overnight. We don't see all of the, the work and the time and the trials and tribulations that went into it. So, I mean, you face some like day one, you know, uh, with a personal tragedy and then the business, uh, you know, the, you know, it'll be a blip when you look back on it, but at the time it seems like devastating. Um, on the flip side, what's been one of the proud moments, milestones? You know, I, I think for us, it's it's exciting every day because we get to create and bring so many different products to life. And we've worked with companies that are, you know, as big as $800 million to companies that are just starting. And it's amazing to see the amount of creativity in the world and what people are creating. I mean, that's really the beauty behind it. And I think for us, that's what keeps, it, that's what keeps us going. That's what excites us. And it's an amazing feeling to bring a product to life. You know, I remember when I was in college, I invented the first leather watch shop without holes. I was in class, got a notification from DHL, your package arrived. This was my first sample of these watches. And, you know, I stood up, I'm going to the bathroom, you know, drove home as fast as I could and got to my house, opened the package and I was blown away. You know, this idea that I had in my head yeah. was now pretty cool this product on my wrist. And like that moment that feeling is something we get to create every day for companies and people through sourceify and so that's really the excitement you know there's going to be some highs like getting into y combinator or uh you know raising money but at the end of the day you know those those you know points in a company's life are really just a means to a start or a means to grow totally. you know a lot of people think startups go raise a bunch of money they're successful Raising money is a means to a start. It's, it's you know not a means to an end by any means. I mean, maybe it enables you to pay yeah. yourself some money or yeah. grow your team faster and more effectively. But you know, r raising money means you've got a lot of a lot of responsibility and yeah. got to make a return on that money for your investors. Totally, I'm sure anyone invests in you are will record that bit to them. Is it yeah. <laughs> um, But I have one last question, Nathan, and I just want to tell people. Um, check out trysourceify.com. Trysourceify.com. They have a, they have some great information on there. Check out their platform. 
you know, if you have an idea or if you're a company that wants to actually expand their product line, it's it shortcuts your time. You know, time is valuable. And if you want to shortcut the time that you're spending, it could be a full time job trying to communicate and figure this stuff out. So that's what they do. So check out trysourcify.com. Um, cease and desist from Conor McGregor. Yeah. <laughs> so that was now that's uh, one person I would not want to upset. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Uh, I mean, that was probably the most fun we had last year where for people that aren't listening in, there was, you know, this amazing Conor McGregor suit that he wore to the Floyd Mayweather press conference when him and Floyd Mayweather were fighting. And it had pinstripes going down the suit that said, you know, F U, F U, F U. Um, and we saw that that same night that everyone else saw it and the world was going crazy about it. You know, it was all over uh every media outlet and we said let's manufacture those and i said you know should we and we're like yeah why not so we literally manufactured got samples in a week um did a little photo shoot and i, I the suit fit me so i was the model um, <laughs> from the back i could see you kind of could look like conor mcgregor from the back i don't know yeah, uh, maybe that. i gotta hit the gym a little <laughs> more but <laughs> but you know he, the suit went viral. We launched uh, fuckyousuits.com, and we were all over, you know, Hype Beast, Pro Bible, The Slate. And in the first week, we did $23,000 organically in sales. I wow. mean, these products were priced anywhere from, I think, the wallets were like 40 bucks to the suits being like two or $300. Um, and the margins on them were great. I mean, I'll, I'll send you the article. Like, we're I read the article. It's amazing, okay. yeah. Yeah. Very transparent about the unit economics behind it. And... You know, it was just kind of this dynamic of creating a buzz and following a trend. You know, I think there's always opportunities to create products that follow a trend. And that's really a moment where we hit the nail on the head in terms of building on that momentum. Um, you know, the story doesn't end with us making a boatload of money. It ends with us getting a season to six. You're pinned down and punched in the face. No. Yeah, just... yeah. Partially because, uh, you know, we were using Conor McGregor's uh, IP and images in the marketing that we were doing and weren't really, you know, thinking ahead on, in, in that sense. But um, it was a matter about the experience and, like, just being able to showcase what we can do at Sourceify and also really just being an example for every e-commerce yeah. entrepreneur. Like I think a lot yeah. of times people think it takes, you know, a month or months to actually create a e-commerce company or store. We did it in a few days, you know, and, and then did a good amount of sales in, yeah. in, a, in a week. So you got a cease and desist, but you got something good out of the deal. Yeah. So they gave, uh, you know, two tickets. I, the marketing guys got to go. I was like, you know, Oh, you, you guys, didn't go. So you went, so they went to the, the Mayweather McGregor. Fight. Yeah. Yeah, I, I ended up going to an Irish bar wearing the suit, though. I mean, everyone was taking photos of me there. That was pretty cool. <laughs> well, Nathan, first one, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much. Everyone check out trysourcify.com. This has been a blast. Jeremy, thank you. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand